Okay, hi guys. Um, today I'm going to be covering China from page 460 to 466, and it's in the Tang Dynasty is mainly what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I've done this five times already, and I've ran out of time every time, so I'm going to talk really fast. <laughs> um, so maybe you could just pause it whenever you need to, you know, hear it. Um, so I apologize if I'm talking really fast, but the first one is the Shakyamuni and Prabhacharatna. Sorry for my pronunciation. Also. Um, from the Northern Wei Dynasty in 518. Um, it's the meaning of two Buddhas, and it's the gilded bronze statuette, is what it is. And it represents the meaning of Shakyamuni Buddha, which is on the right. He is right here. And Prabhatotarna. <laughs> yeah. So, that guy's on the left. Um, it shows how the sculptures of Northern Wei Dynasty transformed the Gandhara derived style of earlier Buddhist art in China. Um, it's a private devotional object in a domestic setting um, or a votive offering in a temple, they're not entirely sure. Um, but behind each of the Buddhas is a mandora like flame, or mandorla, M A N D O R L A, which is a flame like almond shaped nimbus, I believe. Oh no, that's not on here. So sorry. Um, which, let's see. Yeah, it's a flame like almond shaped nimbus. Um, and they both sit in the Lala. Tasana pose, which is L A L I T A S A N A pose, um, which means one leg is folded and the other is hanging down, which also indicates relaxation. And the little kind of story behind this is when um, Shakyamuni Buddha was preaching on Vulture's Peak, the Prabhatratna's stupa appeared in the sky and Shakyamuni opens it to reveal himself, or Prabhatratna himself, who had promised to be present whenever the lotus set. Sutra was preached, um, and the Lotus Sutra is an encyclopedia collection of Buddhist thought and poetry. So, that was very cool. Um, next one is very important. It's the Seated Buddha, um, a rock carving in Su Situ, Shanghai, China, in 460 CE. Um, it's a colossal rock cut image of the Seated Buddha um, carved into Sudi rock, and it's 45 feet tall. So, you can kind of, where is my mouth? So, you can kind of get the sense of how large it is compared to this man's head. I mean, these are all just little tiny people, and the statue is massive. Um, he has a gentle smile, which kind of reminds me of the archaic smile, which I thought was kind of cute. And his shoulders are very broad, which they always kind of included in the Chinese um, sculptures and paintings. And his garments are very tight compared to some of the other ones we're going to look at in this chapter. So, um, next one is a sweet altarpiece with Amitabha in attendance from 593. Um, it's one of the few remaining pieces from the Sui Dynasty just because there was so much that went, up, went on in the Sui Dynasty, which I do not have time to talk about, but I might include something in the end just in case. And um, so a little bit of back the background is the Chinese armies marched across Central Asia and they prompted an influx of foreign people's wealth and ideas into China. And there was traders, missionaries, travelers that journeyed into the Tang capital, which then made Shang'an become the, one of the greatest cities in the world during the 7th and 8th centuries. So that was this one. Whoops. Um, our next one is a very important piece, so Marge chart this one. Um, Verokana Buddha, which is... Uh, where did my mouse go? I lost my mouse. Um, okay, so this is the main Buddha in the middle. And it's made out of limestone and is from the Longmen Caves. And it's carved into the face of a cliff, which was kind of interesting. And it's a colossal relief, um, which features the central figure of the Buddha, which is 44 feet tall. So still pretty big like the other one. And the inscription says that the project was completed in 676 when Gaozong, um, he was the Tang Emperor. And in 672, the Empress Wu um, Zitin underwrote a substantial portion of the considerable cost with her own private funds, which kind of means that she loved this piece so much that she bought it, or she sponsored it. And when she declared herself emperor in 683 after Gaozong died, she ruled until 705 when she was forced to abdicate at age 82. So that, I thought was really interesting, because a lot of people in, um, you know, Greece or Egypt were a lot younger than that when they stepped down, I think. And her Buddha is the Verokana Buddha, and it's the Buddha of space and time. Um, he's also the Serene Majesty, is what they call him. And 
all the rest of the figures in the pictures, or in the this picture, um, are smaller than the actual Buddha, but they're still the same colossal size. So I thought that was interesting too. Um, so here's this. Next one is not too important of a piece, so you don't need to make a large shadow in this one or anything, but um, it's from the late 9th and early 10th century. It's a painted silk scroll um, from the Western expansion um, of the Tang Empire, and it increases the importance of Deng Huang. And um, in 7 centuries, the beginning of the period of disunity, the Chinese cut hundreds of sanctuaries of painted murals in the soft rock of the cliff. So this was just part of that. Um, that they did. So, um, next one, again, you don't need to make a mark chart in this one, but it's just um, a wall painting, but it's 10 feet, so it's quite large. I think this one's really interesting, too. Um, it shows how the splendor of the Tang era and religious teachings could come together in a powerful image, and it's richly detailed and brilliantly colored. Um, it kind of just resembles the Tang dynasty as a whole. And Amitabha sits in the center of a raised platform against a backdrop and ornate buildings which were all characteristics of the Tang, Tang Empire, or Tang era, sorry. So this is that Buddha right there. Um, that's the same one we saw right here. Where's my mouse? Where do I keep going to? There we go. That's the same one right there. Um, so you can kind of picture that. So that was that one. Um, real quick, this one. Um, it's a detail of the 13 emperors. Let's see, where did my notes go? Um, it portrays 13 Chinese rulers as Confucian exemplars of moral and political virtue. And Yan Libin, which was a celebrated Tang painter, um, was the master of line drawing, line drawing and colored washes. So he was the one that kind of mastered this beautiful elegance of the light colors and details. Uh, next one is Palace of the Ladies, which is a detail of a wall painting from the tomb of Princess Yangtai, and she was also from the Tang Dynasty. Um, and so it's in her tomb, and it depicts a scene of pleasant court life, and the mirrorless used thick, even contour lines, and did not provide any setting, but the composition effectively conveys depth. Um, they also appear as if they're on a shallow stage, and the women are arranged in two rows in a variety of poses, um, some seen in full face, others in three-quarter views, but they're both from the front and back. So. That's that one. Um, the Nang Horse from 8th to 9th century. Um, it's only one foot high, which I thought was kind of interesting, but I really like this one. Personally, I think it's one of my favorites. Um, it's so Tang ceramists, Tang ceramists achieved renown for their earthenware figurines decorated with colorful lead glaze, lead glazes that ran in dramatic, s oh my goodness, I can't talk, that ran in dramatic streams from the side down the side when a piece was fired. So you can kind of see that, where is it? I'm like right here. So as they would fire, the glazes would just kind of drip down. Um, so these were for burial and tombs and they reflect the importance of the emperors placed on the quality of their stables. So the breed in this piece represents, is resemb oh my goodness, is resembled in his powerful in bill, which probably means that his owner was the same way. And he's richly harnessed and saddled, and the horse testifies to its rider nobly. And his beautifully arched neck terminates in a small, elegant um, head. So his neck is really beautifully arched, but then he has a smaller head, which I thought was kind of cool, too. So here's this. Dun, dun. Okay, finally, our last extremely important piece is by Fan Quan. Um, it's from the Song Dynasty, and it marks the apogee of Chinese landscape paintings. And um, in the painting, there's a vertical landscape and massive mountains rising from the distance. And there's only a few and few, oh my goodness, few human and animal forms. Um, so there's a mail, a mule train in the bottom right corner, which is right. Where's my mouse? Here we go. Right here. Um, let's see. Dun, dun, dun. Um, the artist spent long days in the mountains studying configurations of rocks, trees, and the effect of sunlight and moonlight on natural forms. Um, also, they showed some elements from ground level, which are the boulders, and some from the top, which is the shrubbery and the highest cliff. When there's a lot of shifting perspectives, which leads the eye on a journey through the mountains, 
and focus not only on the large compounds but on the smaller, more intricate details as well. So you can kind of see that in here. It's a lot more detailed than anything we've really seen yet. And they use texture strokes, or he used texture strokes, which are model massive forms and convey a sense of tactile surfaces. And he employed a small pale brush mark, or small pale brush marks, the kind of texture stroke the Chinese called raindrop strokes. So you can really see that in the mountains too. A really beautiful texturized stroke. So this was a really important one, so make no that one please. Um Second to last piece is our hand scroll from, it was ink and a lot of colors on silk. Um, the Chinese regarded the white cranes that appeared on Huizong Palace as an auspicious sign that he made, um, that their ruler made it to the heavens. And um, it's a masterful combination of elegant composition and realist, realistic observation. And it displays the emperor's style as both a calligrapher and a painter. So that's kind of what the characters say on the side. And the characters consist of thin strokes and each is meticulously aligned with its neighbor to form a neat vertical road. So everything about this picture is very exact and precise. Um, the painter carefully recorded dark black and red feathers of the bright white cranes and depicted them in various different views to suggest that they are circling around the roof. So this is kind of where we see all that movement again. So. And finally, our last piece is the Meeping Vase from, um, sorry for my pronunciation, Ziwi, China, um, from the 12th century. And um, they use the Segrafito technique, which is incising through a colored slip during the Northern Song period. So that's kind of when this came in here. And it features vines and flowers creating by, created by cutting through black slip. So you can kind of, you could definitely see that on the, the vase. And um, this base is a meeping, which means high shouldered shape, which you can kind of see in the picture. It's very high shouldered, you know, and then here's the neck. But rather than, you know, something that we would put our flowers in, sort of thing. And more commonly, they had elegant shapes with fluid silhouettes. So you can definitely see that here. I like this piece, it's very beautiful too. We have something in my house, sort of similar. And now every time I see it, I tell my mom about this piece because I just love it so much. Same as this. Okay, I finally finished with enough time this time. I hope it made sense. Um, if you have any questions, you can always ask too, because I know I talked really fast and now I have minutes to spare. Uh, okay, well, thank you for bearing with me and my bad pronunciation and talking really fast. <laughs> and I'll see you guys after Christmas. So I hope you all have a really good holiday and thanks for watching.